is dying without our deliver we'll rise and pray we'll rise and pray till the whole world hears till the whole world knows we'll send us out where you would have us go till the lost world hears till the last one Hello and welcome to the Santa Ponsa Community Church online service. It's a great privilege to be able to provide this for you. Uh, and today we're going to be looking at the letter that Jesus wrote in the book of Revelation to the Church of Philadelphia. This is going to be part two. We looked at uh, the brotherly love church. We looked at the fact that it was the whole, he who is holy, he who is the real one, he who has the keys of David. And today we're going to look at he who opens doors that no man can shut. And even though we might have little strength. So be blessed as you um, listen and as you learn and as you grow. May God bless you. Hey guys, good morning and welcome to the Santa Ponza Community Church online uh, announcements this morning. Uh, I've just got a few announcements to share with you today. First of all, um, why don't you hop onto our social media pages, Facebook and Instagram, and please like and share the sermons. It helps to get God's word out and it helps to get God's word recognized. Also, if you're on this service this morning, log on, say hello, let us know who you are and where you're from. We always love to interact with you. Um, the second thing I'd like to announce this morning is Right Now Media. It's basically like a Christian Netflix. If you would like uh, an account, send us an email to santaponzachurch at gmail.com with your email address and your name and address, um, your details, and we'll get you hooked up with an uh, account. And it's, it's amazing. It's like a Christian Netflix. It's fantastic. Um, the third thing I'd like to mention is the book of the week. This week, it's Why Grace Changes Everything by Chuck Smith. It's a great book. It's all about grace. And if you want to know why grace triumphs over everything and why grace will change your life, get this book. It's a few euros. We have a link to Amazon where you can go on and buy it. And it's a fantastic book. Check it out. And the last thing I'd like to mention is the food bank. Um, we have the food bank social media pages. Log on to them and say hello, like and share them. Uh, the, it's the Santa Ponza food bank. There's an Instagram page and a Facebook group. And the more that we can get the word out about the food bank, the better. And lastly, I'd like to just introduce you to a short video that the, the church and the food bank did um, with a tennis tournament at the Tennis Academy in Pagera. Watch this and check it out. It's fantastic. God bless and have a great day. Hi, I am Magreta, um, and I support the initiative of Santa Ponza Community Church to start a food bank in the area of Calvia. Why, would you say, why in this beautiful island Mallorca we have all these problems due to the corona crisis? A lot of people are without work. Tourism went down 82%, so everybody who is working in tourism or with tourism is without a job. I'm one of the lucky ones. Thankfully, I still have a job, a roof over my head, and food on the table. But you should know how many people don't have that. Hi guys, I'm Tom. Rafa Pesta asked me five weeks ago if I wanted to help to start up a food bank and I, I said of course I do. I wanted to help and give something back to the community so I thought in yeah, doing some, some bags with food and handing it out and uh, this is how things started. So this thing got big and very quickly 
we are dealing with uh, Ayuntamiento de Calvia. Uh, we are getting supported by the food bank in Palma, El Banco de Alimentos de Mallorca, which, which is the official and very important part here in, uh, for food distribution in, in Spain, actually. So this thing got really a full-time job already. We are here at the Tennis Academy Mallorca in Baguera. They are organizing a tennis tournament for us as a fundraiser of our food bank. Uh, this is five weeks ago when Raf asked me if we want to do a project together. And uh, this is a wonderful day. There are more than 50 players and just let's have a walk. Come with me. So these guys have about 15 uh, tennis courts here, 50 players. So there's enough space for all of them. No risk and uh, yeah, they were asked to pay 25 uh, euro as uh, fees to start playing or to bring 10 kilos of uh, basic food like rice and, and spaghetti or whatever and drop it off here. So uh, let's continue walking. Yeah. I never did anything uh, to help other people uh, in, in an organization or so. I always wanted to get uh, help going directly to the people without any administration and stuff involved. So when Raf asked me if I want to do this project, I was 100% convinced right from the start that this is the project I was looking for and that this is the right moment to start uh, giving back something to society here. We had such a good time here the last 25 years in Mallorca. There's so many people in need, so I want to share a bit. I want to give back and use my time with a purpose. Hey man, schön dich zu sehen. Hallo. Good. Yeah. So when we started this project, I didn't know actually what a food bank is and uh, how to do it. So I got in touch with uh, the Federación Española de Bancos de Alimentos, and they are really helping us uh, here with the branch in Palma, el Banco de Alimentos de Mallorca, and. Uh, Things are developing extremely quick and uh, powerful and I think we're going to have the legal part ready within a couple of days. We really need at the moment our uh, premises. We need a room already with good public access and a safe place to store food. We need transport to pick up food from Banco de Alimentos de Mallorca and uh, yeah, maybe some more volunteers if you want. Thank you, Ali and Valerie. This was a great job, amazing thing. When Ali told me uh, that they're gonna do a uh, yeah, fundraiser uh, event here for us, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, this is a, was a, a, a wonderful afternoon for me to see. Uh, yeah, it was amazing to see how tennis bring, is bringing people together from all over the place, and uh, this was. Uh, I used to play before, but I stopped, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. But I still just, when I closed my eyes and listened to it, it was a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for, the, uh, for your donations. Uh, we started this project, Food Bank project, uh, five weeks ago, uh, because uh, more and more people are uh, contacting church and asking for food. I mean, we are in Calvia, and these guys are asking for food, and they really need it. Island of Mallorca is in trouble. If you have food on the table, please also provide for someone else. It might happen one day to you. Thank you for all your help. You can find the information of the Food Bank Santa Ponza on the website, on the Facebook, on Instagram, and on a lot of other pages where other people are already helping. Thank you. open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, 3, actually. I'm all mixed up today. And we are studying the letter that Jesus wrote to Philadelphia, to the church of Philadelphia. It is very important. To me, the whole Bible is inspired by God. The whole Bible was written by the Spirit of God. But there's something about these seven letters. These seven letters are, are written by Jesus himself. And Jesus doesn't know just the outward appearance. He knows the heart. And he writes to these seven churches and he puts a mirror before them. They're believers, but 
like many of us, we, uh, like all of us really, we have areas to grow in. And you know what? We should never be scared to look in the mirror. Yesterday we were talking with Lizzie uh, about going to the, su- to the stores now to try on clothes. And we found out that some of the stores don't actually allow you to try clothes theirs anymore. But, the other, but, but what they do do is they let you buy the clothes and take them home. And Lizzie goes, oh, I like that better because I can look at myself in my mirror. <laughs> and then I just kind of thought of that little mirror, you know, the little queen. Mirror, mirror on the wall. And then, but sometimes we want our mirror, don't we? We want to see what we think of ourselves or what people think of us that like us. But really what we need, ultimately what we need in our life is the mirror that Jesus puts before us, knowing, knowing that he loves us. Knowing that he would never do something in our life to harm us, even if he harmed us, it would be to grow us. Remember, he is the great physician. And sometimes the surgery might be painful, but it is for healing. And in these letters, we see things that are difficult to, to, to search our hearts about, but it is beneficial for us. And it's very important that we look at these things. But last week, we looked at the Church of Philadelphia, and Philadelphia means the church of brotherly love. And we saw that love is not to be something sentimental. It is not just to be a feeling. It's to be um, an emotion, a a reality that that in turn turns into actions. And we looked at kindness, affectionate, loving in honor, giving preference, um, that love that continues, love that is steadfast, love that is sincere, love that is fervent, and love that is growing. And we looked at the fact that that comes by not just trying to love, but by actually seeing Jesus, the Holy One. And we don't compare him to anyone. We must go there to draw out what love looks like. We go there to to draw out what righteousness looks like, what justice looks like. And it is there that we see. And you know what? When I was um, a young man in Bible college in Austria, I had a young girlfriend. I was trying to have a girlfriend. And we drove over to Venice. And as we were driving back for different circumstances, you know how sometimes you can be in the car with somebody, but but God is just dealing with your soul. And I was dealing, he was dealing with me, and, 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 I, and I was frustrated because I tried to drive into Venice. I didn't know you couldn't drive into it, so I left without ever going into it. I've been to Venice like five or seven times, and I've never actually been inside of this. Yeah, so it's frustrating. But anyway, I'm coming back, and then my dad would give me things, take away, or then he would, he left when I was five. And then you sort of carry baggage into Christianity. You carry baggage into your knowledge of God. You carry your own uh, background. And, and I remember just, just thinking, man, Lord, and, and you do this, and then you're going to take away, and you're going to leave me or this. And, 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 and it's like, man, it was like as real as a person sitting next to me. Not audible, but just the sense of the sentence, don't compare me to anybody. Don't compare me to anybody. There's no one you can compare me to me on earth. You cannot compare me to your father, your mother. No one loves you like I love you. And he's the holy one. And we saw, he, who, he, he writes, he who is true is writing to the church. And the word true, we saw that there's two Greek words, right? One word was alethes, which means true in a sense of a true statement or a false statement. Or alethinos, which actually is true in the sense of that which is real as opposed to that which is fake. And Jesus says, I am holy, don't compare me to anyone, but I am the real one. Everything else is not ultimately real. And then we looked at the fact that he is the one who has the kings of David, the keys of David, and that went with Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, when Shebna was deposed and uh, another guy was put in place and he was given the keys of David. And what that meant is that was, that was the keys of the treasury. 
And whenever he opened the treasury, the resources were available. And whenever he shut the treasury, there was no resources available. Everything went through him. And Jesus says, I have the keys of David. When I open the resources of heaven, everything's available. I have the ultimate authority. And we look at these things. And, and of course, once you see the Holy One, once you see the... the um, the one who holds the keys of David, and once you see the, that he is the real one, then all of a sudden we respond in love. We're going to become the brotherly love church, not by looking at each other, but by ultimately getting to know Jesus better. And as we get to know him and we see our insufficiencies and his magnificence, then all of a sudden we begin to look at people as who they will be and not as who they are. And we begin to see people as bought by the blood of Jesus. Remember what happened with Loretta when I got in an argument? Uh, I got in a big argument with Loretta. And, and then as soon as I hung up the phone, the, the phone here rang in the church. And, um, and, and um, it was Peter Will. Peter Will, Peter Will was like, hey, how you doing, Raph? I'm like, I'm not doing good. I just got in an argument with Loretta. And I really don't feel like talking right now. And he goes, okay. Bye-bye. And we hung up. And then I get an email from him. It says, Raph. I was really concerned by our conversation. Please take care of my sister. And in that moment, I realized, my goodness. You see, as I see Jesus, Loretta's not just my wife. She is Peter's sister in Christ. And therefore, she is also my sister. But then she ultimately belongs to Jesus. So in a sense, it was like, be careful how you take care of her. You're dealing with somebody else's property. <laughs> Jesus. And, you know, as we see him, that we, we begin to deal with each other differently, don't we? But then verse 8 goes on to this church, this brotherly love church. I know your works. Now, I know your works can be a really scary thing. You know, when you're raised up Catholic, you, almost, you always think that Jesus is looking at you, and he's just looking there with the hammer. You know, kind of like, you did that. And, and Jesus doesn't look like that. But, but you kind of have this mentality that he's watching in order to judge instead of he's watching in order to heal, in order to help, in order to save. But the sentence, I know your works, can be very comforting or very troubling depending on what we're up to. This thing's crazy. Some people, I don't know if they have maybe three layers of passwords. And then you sit with them to have a conversation and it's just like, they turn it upside down. It's like, man, what do you got to hide? And then the other one that baffles me is couples. And it's like, they have different passwords and it's like, hey, hey. don't look at my phone. You know, I'm just like, what in the world? In my house... Loretta sometimes has got my phone, and she's like, hey, what's that? <laughs> and, and she never does it. She's not doing it because she's jealous. She's not doing because she's insecure. She's not doing because she thinks I'm up to no good. She really does it because she's just curious what pictures I took or, what, or what's going on. She's like, hey, when were you talking to that person? And I'm just like, I don't feel like really going into it right now. But point made is that, there's nothing to hide. And I think our lives should be like that. Of course, if we have top secret, if you are CIA or a spy, like I tell Jonathan I am, and he doesn't realize that I am, but I told him I am, so he doesn't think that I am. Because if I was, I wouldn't tell him, you know. And, but if I was a spy, then I could keep things secret in, in my phone. But I'm not a spy. Well, maybe I am, and I have another phone. But, but sorry, he's there. He did the lyrics today, Jonathan, you know. So, but um, the, the point being is that, you know, when Jesus says, I know your works, there's nothing we can hide from him. And you know what? If I like to think of I, I know your works as 
maybe you're in a job and you have a bad boss. And you're working your rear end to please that guy. And he just comes and he insults you and he mistreats you. And he does wrong to you. And you endure it. Because you're a Christian, you're concerned for his salvation. And you actually want to be a good example to him. And you actually stay extra, although he doesn't pay you more. And you get weary and you get frustrated. And then the Lord comes near you and says, I know your works. And you're like, I'm so glad that somebody notices. Or maybe, I actually was thinking of Dorothy. I mentioned her in the first service without mentioning her name. But I remember when Dorothy and Kuno were here and they had the triplets and they had fostered these three little lives. And I remember Dorothy just saying, I just want some adult conversation. And you have Jesus come along and say, I know your works. I know what you're pouring into these little girls. I know it's hard work. Or maybe you've been mistreated and abused in some way. Or maybe... You've been left sort of bankrupt and, and you've been working so hard and you've given so much to others. Maybe you've been serving and serving and serving people and, and, and these particular people, you've been serving them for years and not once have they said thank you. And Jesus comes and says, you know what? I know your works. Let me tell you this. If Jesus comes along and he says, I know your works, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. At the end of the day, nothing will matter ultimately but what he thinks. And you know what? When we know that we're right with him and he says, I know what you're going through, it gives strength to our soul, doesn't it? I can go through anything if I know that Jesus knows, if I know that Jesus is with me, if I know that Jesus understands. But if I have my whole life set and I think that something is wrong with Jesus, my world falls apart. But notice, in 1 Peter 2.19, it says, For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering, or wrongfully. Whenever you go through things and you do it consciously because you are a Christian and you say, you know what, I am going to endure through this thing because I'm a believer and I know that he'll take care of my back. This is where God says, my goodness, this is amazing. You're enduring with that knucklehead because you love me? You're enduring in that job not because of the promotion that that other guy get it that doesn't deserve it, but you're enduring because you want to be a light in this job? And God goes, man, that is incredible. I know your works. But notice what it says later. He says, see, I've set before you an open door. And no one can shut it. I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. Notice what it says. In verse, says, in verse 8, it says, behold. In verse 9, it says, behold twice. In, whole, in verse 11, it says, hold fast. And then afterwards, it says, here, see, look, behold. Look at the open door before you. And you know what, guys? Many times, many times, we are looking for this great thing to do that we want to do rather than seeing the open door that Jesus has set before us. In COVID, my goodness, lockdown comes. I mean, wasn't that surreal? You couldn't go out. I remember when they locked us down and, and the, only re the only way you could go for a walk is if you had a dog. I'm just like, that doesn't make any sense. So I have a little stuffed animal dog and I put a leash around them and I went to the field behind my house and and here I am we we, we have the dog there and and as soon as we were out there the police came Boo! and that's not even a road that's just a little dirt road and the police were there and they come with the speakers hey hello 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 and I'm just like yeah we're here and they go only one person of the family can walk the dog at a time and I'm just like, oh, how do we do this one? And Loretta goes, I got it. And she takes the dog and she goes, okay, let's go. <laughs> and we went home, <laughs> you know. <laughs> 
But in lockdown, we're locked in the house. We can't go anywhere. We can't do anything. And we could, and you know, there was some bad aspects to it, but there was some wonderful aspects to it. You see, I've been praying for more family time. Toma. Family time. I'd been praying not to, you know, I had some trips ahead, but I didn't really feel like flying. And all of a sudden, you can't fly. And next thing you know, you're like, okay, what do we do here? And next thing you know, so I get a phone call from Germany, and, it's, and, and, and the guy, I never met him, and he says, I want to show you how to get your church online. And there we were with an open door. And we had people tuning in from Zimbabwe, from South Africa, from Scotland, from America, from all over the world. People were tuning into church here in little Santa Ponsa. We haven't, you know, Jesus says, I've set an open door before you. And then COVID happens and we're talking to a few people. And here we are, and Tom says, oh, you know, I told him, I said, we'd like to do something with food and, and do a food bank. And, and, and other, other guys of you have been saying that, and we got together, and we began to have meetings on Tuesday. And at one point, I'm thinking, this is too big. I, I, don't, I ain't got no time for this. I said, Tom, why don't you take it on? And next thing you know, he becomes a machine. This Do Doverman is just kind of like, oh, my goodness, where is he taking us? And, and next thing you know, we're involved in a food bank. Look at the open door before us. And it is an amazing thing. And then when I was in Cuba, we, I met Zuli, and we wanted to do a school. And, and Zuli, next thing you know, she moves over. And then we get Michael to organize us. And then we get Niels, and we get Deborah, and we get Jackie, and we get Hugh. And, and you get this amazing team together to start this school. And, and you just kind of go, my goodness, I set an open door before you. But sometimes we don't see the open door Unless we look. Sometimes we just need to pray not of what we dream that we could do, but rather what God has put before us. You know, there's, there, there, there's sometimes the mentality can creep into our, our hearts on what we would, how we would like to serve the Lord, where the Lord is actually saying, I've set an open door before you. See? Look, behold, get involved. Maybe it's not exactly what you wanted to do, but it's what I have for you. And what else would you want in life except what he has for you? What else is worth doing? Remember, the apostle Paul was imprisoned. What did he do? What did he do while he was in prison? Anybody can tell me? What's that? Pray. Okay, great. That's a great opportunity, Jonathan. And wrote what? Letters. Martin, you cheated. You told him. But think about this. If he would have never been in prison, maybe he wouldn't have written those letters. And if he didn't write those letters, neither would you have read those letters. And the impact he had locally for a time, God put him in prison so he would have a global opportunity and a timeless opportunity to serve the Lord. After all, every generation has read the letters that he wrote. Every generation has read those letters. Isn't that amazing? And sometimes we just have to make the most of the opportunities that are before us. Here has been always a ministry of open doors. The Bible college, we did the Bible college for 10 years. How did it start? Dave Shirley said, why don't you do a Bible college? It's easy. Huh, easy. Huh. 10 years of labor, but a fruitful labor. It was wonderful to do it, but it was an open door that the Lord set before us. And my question is, what are the opportunities that are before us? What is the door in this context? And, you know, here in this particular verse, the door, no doubt, most likely is the door of missionary opportunity. In 1 Corinthians 69, Paul says, a wide door has opened, an effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Isn't that amazing that Paul says, I have a great and powerful and effective door, but it's not easy. Sometimes we think it's if it's an open door, if it's easy. 
And something that he's been saying to us as we've been doing the school, uh, the school he's been saying, the school is not for the, this project is not for the faint-hearted. And my favorite verse in the Bible is becoming, oh, that I had wings like a dove and I would fly away and be at rest. That's my life verse right now. I just want to go. It's difficult. But you know what? When things are difficult, does not mean that it is an open door. It might just be a great and effective door, although it's difficult. 2 Corinthians 2.12, Furthermore, when I came to trust to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened to me by the Lord. And, and there he was. He came to Troas. He had, gone, he had tried the north by Galatia. He tried south. And all the doors closed. And next thing you know, he ends up at Troas. And who does it find there? He finds there Luke. Many people think he found Luke because he was a doctor. And he had, and, and he had an eye problem that he got in, uh, in, in Galatia, actually. And while he's there with Luke, he sees a vision. And then they go to the open door of taking the gospel to Europe. And the, and the gospel expands. And, you know, Paul believed in these open doors so much that in Colossians 4.3, when he asked for prayer, he says, please pray for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Open doors. Open doors to lead people to Jesus. Open doors of a responsibility before us. Open doors of our time with our family. Open doors of, of, of just how to use our time. Open doors in our community. Open doors in our Sunday school. Open doors and you fill in the blank. What is before you? What has God put before you as an open door? But then the next thing that might come is the thought is like, well, yeah, it's a great open door, but I'm just not sufficient to do that. I just don't have the strength. I just don't have what it takes to do that. Maybe somebody else. Why don't you take Wayne? Why don't you take Brenda or Tom or, or Kuno? Take somebody else. And you know what is interesting? There was a Bible college, a Billy Graham Bible college, and, the, and, the, and the everybody walked like Billy Graham, everybody talked like Billy Graham, and everybody held like their Bible like Billy Graham. And the principal of the school got up there and he said, how many wish that there was two Billy Graham and none of yourself? Or two of somebody else and none of yourself? And sometimes we see open doors and we just wish that maybe somebody else would do it. Because we see the weakness of our soul. We see the weakness of our heart. We see the weakness of our mind. And we just think to ourselves, we just can't do that. But notice the next verse. It says, I have an open door, for you have little strength. And some people think that's a rebuke. You're weak. But it's, it's not a rebuke. It's actually an acknowledgement. I know your works, and I know you have little strength. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you have little strength. You see, we are in danger of thinking that having it all together and being self-confident is what it takes to serve the Lord. But I would venture to say that it's the exact opposite. That it is when we have a sense of our weakness, our frailty, it is then that we're actually ready to serve the Lord and not till then look how often God's man was marked not by self-confidence but by weakness think of Gideon hey you're the man of God that's going to deliver Israel Me? And he said, my clan is the weakest, and I am the least in my family. And then he put the fleeces there. It can't be me. Look at Moses when he first said, I'm going to deliver Israel. And next thing you know, he goes to the desert for 40 years. And when the time comes in the bush, he hears the Lord speaking to him, I am that I am. It's time. And Moses says, go to somebody else. 
How will they know you sent me? I can't speak. Think of when Jeremiah was called. Remember Jeremiah? What did he say? I'm young. I can't speak. What marked, the pe- what marked the people that God used greatly in the world was not their self-confidence, was actually the self-awareness of weakness, but the confidence that God was leading them. As a matter of fact, Paul said, when I am weak, it is then that I am strong. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says, verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure, lest I should become proud by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded. I asked the Lord for three times to take that insecurity away or that weak point away or whatever it was, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And you know what? We want to serve the Lord when we feel strong. And the Lord says, no, no, I want you to serve me when you feel weak. Because you know that I'm putting you there. I know you're relying on me. And many times he draws us to a place of weakness so that we realize that our strength is from him. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. How would you like your pastor to give you this resume? Let's say you were looking for a pastor, and I know you're not because you're so happy with me, but, but let's say that you were, hypothetically. And, and, and let's say that in his resume, which resumes, by the way, are where most lies are put, I think. Resumes nowadays is like I speak three languages and I can do spreadsheets and I've done this and I've done that. And next thing you know, you put this incredible resume. When they get to work, they don't know any of the things. Hey, do you speak German? Yes. Hello. In English? Yes. Goodbye. And that's it. And they put three languages. You know? But look at what Paul says to the Corinthians. When I came to you, in verse 3 of chapter 2, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. How would you like to, you know, it's like, we're going to have a guest, uh, we're going to have a pastor come to serve at this church. It's like, so how are you feeling about the job? I'm weak. I'm actually scared to death. (laughs) To the point that I'm just full of fear. Oh, I think we'll take somebody else. <laughs> and then lo comes the self-confident guy. And you think to yourself, now he's the guy. And we have this mentality of having to purport to be someone who we're not. Where the greatest liberty in the world comes when we're able to show who we are. Knowing that God uses the foolish things of the earth. Knowing that God uses the weak things of the earth to confound the wise. And that's why I'm determined. I'm determined that I'm going to share always the things that are weak in my life. I mean, you really want me to just come here and say, like, what a wonderful marriage, what a wonderful life, what a wonderful dad I am, and live under that pressure. And then you go home and you start feeling sorry for yourself for what a terrible parent, what a terrible husband or wife you are, and what a terrible worker you are. No, I think we need to realize that we all are people of like passions. And God uses us in spite of us, not because of us. And God uses us when we feel weak. And you know what is the times where I felt weak to do something and actually say, okay, Lord, for you I will do it, that afterwards you think to yourself, oh, my mommy, God, that's amazing. God used it. I want you to look at this verse, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12. You're going to love this one. This should become your life verse whenever you are afraid and whenever 2 Chronicles 20, 20, verse 12. 20, verse 12. 
of 2 Chronicles. The Jehoshaphat's one of the great kings of Israel, of Judah, actually. And, um, and, and a great army comes against them. And, you know, he's, he sees the, 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 the chariots. He sees the soldiers coming. They're greater in multitude. And he's like, how in the world are we going to deal with this situation? We, we, and, and he's the leader. He can't show weakness. Notice verse 12. Oh, Lord God, will you not judge them? For we have, what? No power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor, we do, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Isn't that a wonderful verse? Isn't that a wonderful verse to say, man, we have no power against that? And actually, I don't even know what to do in this situation. It's beyond me. But you know what? I got my eyes fixed on you, Jesus. I got my eyes fixed on you. And I don't know the plan. I don't know the game. I don't know anything. But I'm going to have my eyes on you. And I realize that you are the master chess player, that you will move everything where it needs to go, and that you will do beyond and above all I can think or ask. That even if I'm in prison, I will look at the opportunities, and then no matter what is going on, even if I don't know what to do, that yet... I don't need to move my eyes from you because I know that you don't move your eye from me. <laughs> and dude, are you aware of that? Are you aware that actually when you feel the weakness of your soul, it's when you're actually trusting in him. Listen, everybody's afraid. We have the Facebook syndrome. Everything looks beautiful. But everybody's afraid. Unless you're super arrogant, everybody is afraid. Unless you're super ignorant, everybody's afraid. Everybody gets nervous in front of people. Everybody gets nervous at the task. I don't, you know, even, uh, not, uh, even um, uh, Lincoln said, that he often got brought down to his knees just out of the sheer knowledge that he had nowhere else to go. Here is the president of the United States saying, I have nowhere else to go. So don't be seduced or lied by people who make it seem like they're all okay. Nobody's all okay. Let's be real. Let's grieve. Let's, let's be able to have a weakness, but let's not let the weakness rule over us. Let not the fear rule over you. Let us be people that apart from him we can do nothing, and we know that well, but we know that we can do all things through him who strengthens us. And that's the trick. The art of being stripped of ourselves. And then when we see, and we see the reality, we're self-aware. We can't accomplish anything. It's not because of us. But when we see his power, we see his working, we, we see his patience, we're able to draw strength. And then finally, verse 8. This is the great qualifier. The, the great qualifier is not the strength, the wisdom, the power that we might have. The great, the great qualifier is verse 8. You have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Loyalty to Jesus. You know, in these, in these days that we've been living, the last couple, actually in the last few years, I've appreciated loyal friendships more than ever. Not in a demanding way, but just people that are not perfect, but they're there. People that are, that are able to overlook certain things, not nitpick and, 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 and point out mistakes, but people that are able to, we're able to encourage one another, knowing that love, love covers a multitude of sins, and we see our insufficiencies, but we remain in the longevity of friendship, loyal to one another. And I think to myself, you know what, that is, I believe, what God loves so much when people are loyal to him. Look what Jesus says to him. You have not denied my word. Guys, 
This book is not for us to go out there and give people our opinion of, a, of this book. We are not Bible critics. We are Bible ambassadors. So our job is to search and interpret the meaning of this book and give that to people and share it with people in a spirit of humility and love. That is our task. We are ambassadors that go from one country to another country, not try to bring our law into place, but actually to express the heart and properly represent the heart of that other country that we come from. And like Billy Graham said when they asked him, so what do you think about this sin, sexual immorality? And he says, well, it doesn't really matter what I think. The Bible says this. That's the attitude we need to have. We are ambassadors. And, and, and without being rigid, without being, without being um, a bigot, but very lovingly and very clearly, we need to be able to say, but what do you want me to do? It's God. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, it's God. Like, for example, if you go to someone, it's like, you got to put a seatbelt on. Oh, I mean, imagine I go to Tom. Don't worry about putting the seatbelt on. I know the law says that, but don't worry about it. And then somebody else goes, but that's the law of the land. It's not for me to give my opinion of what you should wear and what you shouldn't wear. It's the law. And, and in the same way, we create, we, we communicate the character of God, not on the basis of our opinion, but on the basis of what he's left for us to explain to people, to explain to us and, and people. And that's why I love Ezra. Ezra is amazing to me because it says that he set his heart to know the word of God, to practice the word of God, and to teach the word of God to the people, to give a sense of what the Bible says to the people. And that is a responsibility. And, and listen, I don't like indoctrinating people and you know that I've never taken you it's like you got to believe this 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 and this and this but I would say this you have to believe the Bible and what the Bible says about itself and we have we should have a sense where we're reading the Bible ourselves and we come to a sense of what the Bible is saying about stuff and that is the ultimate authority you are not the authority the Bible is the authority and the Philippi and, and sorry the, the church of Philadelphia they come there and they and they and Jesus says to them you've not denied my word You've not taken the sins of the Nicolaitans and thought about these sins and, and, and said, oh, well, you know, it doesn't really say that. No, no, you've been faithful to my word. You've been lovingly faithful to my word. And we have a responsibility in our day and age. Our day and age, they're moving further and further away and even accusing us of the Bible being archaic. The Bible is the most relevant book in the, in the, in the world. It dissects our society. And it is our responsibility to know it to practice it, and to communicate it in a loving way. Because it is the only anchor for our society as it stands. And not only the only anchor, but it's the only hope of the salvation of man. Paul told Timothy, notice in Timothy, and uh, notice what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. which is similar times to today, God is doing great things, but nevertheless, there's a lot of craziness going on too. And in Timothy, um, sorry, I'm getting lost here. Um, my goodness. It says, I charge you therefore before God. And this guy was a shy, timid guy. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Notice what it says in chapter 3, verse 14. But you must continue. No, sorry, verse 16. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness that the man of God be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. He says the Bible is inspired and Paul tells Timothy, 
preach it, teach it. And you know what? That is what we have to give. And, Paul, and Jesus tells the church of Philadelphia, you haven't denied my word. You've been faithful to my word. And listen, we have nothing else but the word of God. The Bible says this. Jesus said this. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Listen, if you are not reading your Bible as a believer, you're anorexic. You're anorexic. Jesus said that the word of God feeds our soul, feeds our spirit. And we need to do whatever we can to just chew on it and meditate on it and think on the character of God. We looked at Nehemiah chapter 9 and you see how they were reading the word and they were seeing the God of creation, the God of delivery, the God that is kind, the God that is merciful, the God that is forgiven. And they were chewing on the word of God. And by chewing on the word of God, they were being saturated and submerged in the character of God. And the reason that we're tossed from place to place at times and the reason we're starving and anorexic is because we're not being fed in the Word. It's not enough to come on a Sunday morning and get a Bible study. It's not enough. It would be like saying, hey, come to a men's breakfast and then you don't eat for the rest of the week. You'd be like, come on. I mean, you come. By the time you come, you come starving. No, no, you feed yourself every day. And the Bible is not a rule to, it's not a rule to read it. It's a necessity to feed on it. And notice the last thing. It says, and you have not denied my name. And we're going to close with this one. You have not denied my name. Like I said, friendship. A representation of who he is. But guys, listen. A love relationship that we have with him. Louise Cathcart used to come to this church, loved her. She would come, and then she would be like, hey, let me take you to lunch. And then she would be like, what did you say about this? And we would talk about the different things. And, and then she was diagnosed with cancer, and Loretta went to see her. And she said, listen, I haven't walked with the Lord for 20 years to doubt him now. We've been through too much together. And her husband said to me, you know what? At 16, she met the man, and they've had a love relationship ever since. It's a friendship. Our relationship with Jesus is a friendship. Please understand, it's a friendship. We're not religious. We're not ritualistic. It's not about just lighting candles. It's not about us finding peace. It's about actually a loving, dynamic relationship, more real than the relationship that we share with friends or with even marriage partners. And in a relationship, there is loyalty. There is loyalty. And it should not be thought strange that there will be any less loyalty in our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you have not denied my name. What does that mean? You're proud of me. There was a mother and a child and the mother and the and and the ch and her hands were all burned up like this just burned and everywhere they went together that child would say please mommy hide your hands he was embarrassed of her hands Everywhere, please, mommy mommy or didn't want to you know in the teenage years oh mommy stay there you know i don't want you to go with me and then, one day, he actually asked her, Mom, but how did you burn your hands? And she said, well, we had a great fire in the house. And you were locked in a room. And I had to break through the door, and the door was hot, and I burned them there. But then there was wood that was in the way, burning, and I had to pick it up, and I had to push it out of the way. And then I just grabbed you. And I just pulled you out and I ran out. I covered you with a blanket and I ran out and we moved away. And then all of a sudden, he became grateful for those hands. And he became proud of those hands. 
And everywhere he went, he would say, look at my mom's hands. They're the hands that saved me. They're like that because she helped me and she saved me. And Jesus says to the church of Philadelphia, you have not denied my name. What do we have to be ashamed of in the Lord Jesus Christ? What do we have to be ashamed of? We have absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. On the contrary, that sacrifice, those burnt hands, Jesus weak at the cross, and Jesus looking like scrawny and skinny and, and all that stuff that we look at, and, and people mocking, it's like, is that Christianity? Oh, no. He did that to pay for my sins. He, paid, he did that to rescue me. He is the one that rose from the dead. He is the Almighty. He's the one whose my breath is in his hands. My times are in his hands. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He's the Holy One. He's the true one. We dare not deny his nature. We dare not deny his person. Why? Because he's our friend. And he's the ultimate one to be proud of. I mean, think when we get to heaven. And you have ten thousands upon ten thousands upon ten thousands of, of people worshiping on the throne. We won't be ashamed then, will we? And Jesus said, if, if you do not be ashamed of me here, I will not be ashamed of you there. But look, the Philadelphia church, they were... They did not deny his nature. They did not deny his name. And you know what? In this church, I'm really grateful to have a congregation, people. Some of you are, don't know him yet. Some of you are getting to know him. But some of you are growing. And you know what? I think I'm getting, we're getting to a really cool spot here, a really sweet spot. The people... They don't love denominations. They don't love political parties. They love Jesus. And that is the greatest place to be. So will we take that to heart? Open doors. Let's look. Let's see. Let's act. Let's take advantage of it. Yes, we have little strength. But the, the strength, the amount of strength is not what matters. We have his strength. Let's not let the fear, the insecurity, the comparing ourselves by ourselves get in the way. Let's, let's be like David. He didn't see Goliath. He didn't see the army. He sought God. And let's be people that if we're going to be loyal in something, it will not be in self-confidence. The loyalty would be in not denying his nature not denying his name, knowing that ultimately what everybody needs is not us. What everybody needs is him. It's Jesus. That's what they truly need. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word, for your love, for your grace. And I pray, Lord, that um, you would help us, Lord, to grow and help us, Lord, not to be ashamed in any way. We're going to take communion and, and realizing, Lord, that the communion, Lord, it's, it's, it's what you did at the cross. It's us remembering the great sacrifice, your burned hands, so to speak, at the cross. And that that is the great salvation that has come, not just to deliver us from sin, not just to deliver us from death, but to deliver us and raise us up in life. Oh, Lord, what a great privilege we have. What a great privilege we have to remember you, what you did yesterday, who you are today, and what you will accomplish in the future. We love you, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Give us eyes to see the opportunities, the open doors. Help us to be faithful to you as true friends. In Jesus' name, amen.
So we pray that this would have been a blessing to you this morning. You know, what an amazing thing that God opens doors for us, that he provides the ability for us to in, step into things that he created for us since before the foundation of the world to walk in, that we may be fruitful, open doors from him. And what an amazing um, thing that we do not have to have the resources. We might feel weak. We might feel like we don't have what it takes. But he says that although we have little strength, that doesn't matter because at the end of the day, what we serve in his strength, we serve with his resources and that our part in it is to be loyal to his word, to be loyal to his name and let him take care of the rest. May God bless you as you walk with him, as you serve him, as you grow in him. God bless you. Capture my heart, I surrender my will Focus my mind till I'm yielded and still Hearing your voice to answer your call can't speak at all I'm captivated with your love for I'm motivated as you set me free. And this is my heart's desire to know you, Lord, my God. Capture my Surrender my will I focus my mind Till I'm yielded and still Hearing your voice To answer your call Carried away Till I can't speak Capture my heart I surrender my will Carry me away